Hello, uh, I'm Raghu. Uh, I head the sales for Singular in India. Uh, we are a next generation attribution and analytics platform that powers digital marketers to grow faster by uncovering accurate, granular, and timely performance insights. Hi, Raghu. This is Nishant. I've been part of Appful for close to seven years now and currently leading the app acquisition business for Mass. So Mass is an audience-led uh, unified user acquisition platform which helps uh, advertisers across uh, multiple domains to acquire uh, quality users at scale. So today we bring an interesting topic uh, for everyone. Uh, we would be discussing about uh, mobile marketing strategies for every stage of the funnel. Uh, we would be also discussing about the strategies in the new world and uh, you know how to understand that from the lens of uh, media planning and the importance of attribution. So let's get started. Yeah, looking so, forward to it. Um, so I'll, I'll start off, uh, Prabhu, and I'll ask you this question uh, to begin with. I think uh, you know we have already seen COVID coming to an end, and uh, you know there has been a huge uh, growth that we have seen in the space of uh, the apps. Uh, you know, in the last year. So just like to understand from you that what are your thoughts on the ongo uh, ongoing uh, global economic uh, scenario in the app ecosystem? Okay, great. That's an interesting question because we are moving out of one thing and then probably looks like we are entering into a completely different thing. One was uh, related to a downward turn and then uh, followed by another economic kind of like situation. But yeah, uh, again, uh, uh, different categories of app had different reception in the past one year. Uh, as we are about to kind of like completely leave behind the fears of COVID. Hopefully we don't have to uh, ever deal with it again. Uh, I'm at least I'm hopeful that uh, COVID is behind us. Uh, but coming to the category of the apps, I would say uh, e-commerce uh, and food delivery apps are the segments that uh, we have seen a big growth uh, and we predict that uh, they will continue to grow in the com coming years as well. Now, uh, but having said that, like, but my personal favorite is the gaming sector. The gaming sector is where we see a lot of innovation. Uh, when I say innovation, I see Indian studios uh, are working on the global titles, right? Like, and uh, and then these publishers are actually venturing into uh, uh, the owning the complete publishing side of uh, promoting their uh, gamings. So uh, that's one sector that I'm betting high on. And then also, like, if you look at the travel industry as well, right, we are coming out of uh, exactly. COVID and then we have seen that a lot of markets are opening themselves up. Uh, uh, so uh, I'm quite, uh, uh, I have lots of hopes on travel industry to grow uh, a lot. Uh, that's on the categories of the apps wherein we have seen, uh, uh, we have seen in the past one of probably uh, years to come. Uh, and then going on to the uh, economical scenario, uh, as I mentioned, we, uh, we we knew that like we are just getting out of the pandemic and then now mm -hmm. the global recession and macroeconomic situation around the world is kind of like scaring us a lot. <laughs> right. We are uh, we are already seeing its impact uh, uh, in a way where advertisers are actually not uh, uh, spending too much. They, they are reducing their uh marketing budgets probably they will continue to uh do so until the uh, market stabilizes that's my take <laughs> mm -hmm. no absolutely i think especially with the covid getting over people are venturing out pretty much so you no know, i think that sort of changes and uh obviously you know we are seeing the paradigm shift uh, across uh, multiple verticals so yeah yeah now it's my turn uh my question is uh nishant uh how are app marketing campaigns different and important from the digital, general sort of a digital marketing campaigns, which are not app focused? So can you help us kind of like have an understanding on the differences out there? Uh, so yeah, I think uh, digital advertising is a pretty vast uh, topic if you have to actually look at uh, that from the advertising lens. You know, app marketing, as the name suggests, is uh, confined to marketing your app in an efficient way. But today, uh, you know, if you're looking at uh, the overall uh, mobile devices ecosystem, so 
you know we see people getting glued to their uh, devices uh, you know glued to multiple content even while we are watching uh, say netflix or at office we are seeing people glued on to their devices so it is become like really important for advertisers to focus on app marketing you know today even if you are looking at some of the traditional businesses so they are also uh, coming up with their dedicated uh, app marketing strategy we can see that uh, sort of uh, paradigm shift which is happening so at an overall level i think uh, this definitely will be uh, you know going to continue and will be a very important focus for the advertisers if you have to look at uh, you know the app marketing uh, lens okay okay that's interesting thought um, right yeah <laughs> Yeah, so uh, I, I think I have another interesting question for you since we were talking about app marketing. Uh, so, how important do you think is mapping the user journey if you have to actually look at from the attribution lens, right? So, if if you're looking at uh, say post app install event mapping or or uh, you know from the marketing team's lens also, so how important is it for them to actually look at uh, this activity? Oh yeah, uh, I mean like I mean like historically, probably long ago we were. We were talking about CPIs a lot, install measurement and things like that. Now, uh, install only tracking is a thing of past. In fact, it sounds pretty prehistoric to me now. <laughs> I don't even recollect anyone kind of like measuring the KPIs based on purely the installs. Uh, I'm like uh, uh, connecting the performance of post install actions to the source of the campaign and that too at utmost granularity is very very important uh, and also we are we are seeing an uh, uh, increase in advertisers adopting uh, stringent kpis which are again focused around uh, in app actions or in app events right? uh, that's that's what uh, we are seeing a lot from an attribution standpoint of view as well again uh, going back to that connection of the uh, different teams that are being involved probably uh, as far as product team is concerned, it plays a very crucial role uh, in, in the decision making uh, or the growth of an organization. Most, at least from uh, our standpoint of view, again, like we we sit, uh, we are on the MMP side, so most of the conversations with us uh, are actually initiated by the product teams uh, now. Unlike mm -hmm. in the past, where only marketers were kind of like. Uh, kind of like owning the entire conversation. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a big, big change that we have seen. In fact, uh, they even kind of like leave a seat open uh, for like the data science team or an analytics team. That that gives you uh, uh, an understanding. Like that gives you that confidence that uh, uh, digital marketing is not to be looked at uh, in a silo uh, as as we used to because uh, mm -hmm. because now they are bringing in all of these diverse teams who could be part of that uh, uh, growth of the entire user journey into the conversations so i still believe that mapping the user journey between like say mmps or an attribution platform like ours or in-app analytics platforms and marketing automation platforms and even their your internal crm data has become uh, a very uh, mm -hmm. important topic Right. Uh, okay. Again, if you have to do all of this, which is which is very difficult to achieve with the involvement of mm -hmm. uh, with the involvement of uh, without the involvement of non-marketing departments. Right. So yeah, uh, uh, it's it's a really good sign. Uh, right. All the diver, all the different departments who play a very important role in the growth of a brand are coming together and having a collective discussions and then contributing to the entire funnel. So that is something that we have seen a lot uh, and we simply like that approach. Correct, correct. I think from the campaign planning perspective also, this becomes quite important, uh, you know, from, from that lens, like all the teams coming together and the data, you know, sort of being in a single sort of a flow. So that is, uh, that's what I feel is, is quite important. True, true, very true. Uh, yeah, uh, I mean, like that brings me to another question, probably more specific to the campaign, since we brought that. Up. Uh, uh, given that the ad campaigns are so important for uh, any app marketer, right? How do you think, like, we, sh I'm mean, like, maybe the app marketer should go about planning these campaigns, and then planning is one thing, and then 
how can they actually plan it in a most effective manner and efficiently hmm. deliver this? So, right. So as as you mentioned earlier, you know about all the teams coming together, how the data becomes very important in terms of uh, you know planning the campaigns. I feel one thing is also important to look at is that what stage the business is currently in. So you know today we are seeing oh, the apps. Correct. So we are seeing the apps today. Probably, you know, someone would have just done a Series A or uh, an app which would have done, say, a company or a startup would have done Series D, E. So their objectives will be entirely different, right? So Series A advertiser would probably be looking at, uh, you know, just scale from day one to probably go on to getting more users. And obviously, with the competition that, uh, you know, we see in some of the verticals within the app ecosystem. Similarly, I think uh, also depends upon that, okay, what sort of, uh, you know, finally what, what you're looking at in terms of the objectives So whether you're looking at from the lens of more branding perspective or you're looking at more from the, you know, performance-led uh, objective. So it is pretty much de dependent upon some of those factors. Mm -hmm. I think one thing is important, which one needs to look at is having that right balance. Uh, you know, one should be looking at uh, the right uh, users or the audiences, identifying uh, the right users. I think that is very important. You know, there are ways of targeting the relevant audiences through multiple channels today. Um, you know, choosing the right channel is important. Uh, you know, one should be also looking at maybe, you know, are you getting some sort of incrementality out of any of the channels or, uh, you know, also looking at maybe the right sort of diversification that okay right balance can be between say beyond uh sans you know if one has to go go so maybe diversifying into oems or diversifying through some of the network partners or adding ott platforms or even looking at native platforms so all of that combined i think today it is really important to have number one the balanced approach and also then you know as i mentioned earlier i think the objective uh, of the campaigns to probably get uh, say more eyeballs so you know probably more branding led uh, placements or or maybe say video inventories would more uh, uh, would make more sense for that particular advertiser so i think yeah one needs to look at uh, that uh, from the campaign planning uh, perspective yeah that's right i really like the way that you mentioned that like uh, uh, we need to strategize based on what stage that you are in probably focusing heavy on ua at the early stages of your uh, uh, funding and then probably because you need more users and then probably maturing maturing into the uh, re-engagement side of things yeah that's 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 really interesting absolutely yeah absolutely and then also so, i mean like it makes uh sorry to cut you short there like uh, it's also I mean, like when you kind of like gone into these specific details it it makes you really feel that the job of kind of like digital marketer is is so complex probably at times we kind of like <laughs> take these things for granted there's a lot of things that you need to probably take into consideration isn't it <laughs> absolutely absolutely like if you also look at uh you know beyond campaign planning i think metrics and down the funnel uh you know how you're looking at your overall campaign uh, you know from that lens also becomes important so i think there, there's another interesting question for you from you know if you're also, also looking at uh, you know metrics lens so I would like to also ask you that what are some of the key metrics that app marketers should focus on, uh, you know, if you are to look at this year, since we are talking about some of the new age uh, marketing, uh, you know, understanding from, from that lens and also, you know, within the current uh, scenario, uh, you know, what is it that will be important to look at uh, from the app uh, marketing perspective? Shant, when you asked me about metrics, uh, I, I'm under a very strong opinion that we don't need any new metrics because we already have access to a lot of those metrics. Uh, and then those yeah. should suffice. But what is missing uh, currently is, or probably are the tools that allow marketers to easily define these metrics. You have right. a very interesting metrics. Maybe you want to do uh, something like total uh, number of items added to the cart minus the number of items I removed from the cart divided by total number of purchases like you can have your crazy formula mm -hmm. based on the right. vertical that you're catering to uh, but what you're lacking is the ability to define those metrics by yourself and evaluate those metrics against the utmost granular data when i say utmost granular data is the campaign granularity all the way from the name of the source uh, campaign sub-campaign, creative, 
and even keyboard level. That is what is missing. I think utilize the existing metrics and connect it with the uh, uh, with the campaign granularity. That is what I feel that uh, uh, is a gap now. And this gap could be kind of like fulfilled by the tools that brands can actually onboard uh, as part of their growth infrastructure. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, again, surprisingly, uh, we do interact with a lot of these brands on a day-to-day -day basis. Even today, marketers are spending countless amount of hertz in building these metrics, right? They already have the metrics defined, right. but building these metrics is a challenge. Like if I have to give you an example, uh, like say a marketer on a daily basis, they log into two self-attributing networks because by default, they're like mostly Google and Facebook exactly. to start with. And then they would work with maybe about uh, five, 10. It's not limited to that. They can go much mm -hmm. beyond that. Uh, ad networks and affiliate dashboard to pull that data, right? And then they combine they combine this data with their attribution data. And in order to do that, they juggle between about like 10, 20 different exactly. spreadsheets and then kind of like create a fancy report, which they would want to probably present to their CMO by uh, the end of the month or even maybe even for them to act upon that data, right? We strongly believe that this is a very old way of uh, kind of like uh, managing the uh, data uh, uh, and we feel that this is where people can actually invest in uh, tools that would allow marketers to easily automate this entire process and have access to those metrics relevant metrics right uh, absolutely having said that uh, above all uh, one of the top metric uh, 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 again i would say uh, is uh, choosing the right partner. When I say right partner, mm -hmm. a partner which actually saves you a lot of time uh, and mm -hmm. a partner which actually gives you a, a good uh, non-compromising quality, a partner which allows you to operate lean. And if you look at these, these are very much tied to the scenarios like the economic uh, downturn or the economic instability. We need to make sure that our systems are strong, which can kind of like allow us to operate with utmost efficiency. That is what I believe in. And for me, single metric is picking the right channels and then the right tools to kind of like operate with. It so makes sense. Absolutely. I think you rightly mentioned that data is available. It's just that you need to take corrective actions yeah. out of that data. And how can you, you know, probably uh, do the right sort of efficient optimization through some of the tools you know, like, like singular also has that. So pretty much, uh, you know, rightly mentioned. Yes. Uh, now this is my turn. Uh, uh, the next question that I have Nishant is what are the uh, pressure points app marketers actually face during the campaigns? Like usually, uh, they, they start a campaign, uh, they have to deal with a lot of things, right? Like probably creatives, refresh and things like that, understanding the fatigue of the creative themselves or understanding the reach, etc. And how right. can they actually solve these pressure points? Can you give us with like top sure. pressure points and then explain how we solve for those? Right. So, uh, you know, looking at some of the major pain points, pressure points for the advertisers, I think there are three main things which usually most of the app marketers would be looking at. One is driving scale, mm -hmm. driving scale with efficiency. I think that is extremely important and also getting incrementality through the channels that they're working with. Now, how can you have the right strategy to have most of these objectives fulfilled is extremely important. Like we were talking about, uh, you know, earlier having that right sort of balanced approach uh, you know, when you are doing media planning, I think that is again, uh, something which I feel is extremely important. You know, one should be doing regular tests on incrementality. There are multiple tools which are available in the market. So leveraging those tools, though, that, that data in the efficient way, like we we're discussing in the previous uh, question also, you know, how you can actually leverage the data in, in more efficient ways, is extremely important, you know, slicing, dicing that data to ensure that uh, you know taking corrective action uh, that that becomes extremely important right uh, in in fact uh, you know some of the tools that are available also let you uh, see what sort of uh, overlap that you are seeing between multiple channels so how how you can actually weed out some of the non performing channels or probably if you're seeing too much of overlap between multiple channels like for mass you know what what we also do is we give that sort of an option to the advertisers to actually look at 
that uh, you know from the overlap lens as well so these are some of the things which i feel are definitely the pain points also you know one thing is um, you know today that we are looking at is ad fraud i think that is also extremely uh, important which has been there in the industry you know from a pretty long time wherein you know people see issues down the funnel you know you see you can see fraudulent activities which happen publishers are obviously trying to you know game, game the system and one needs to be extremely vigilant on how you can tackle that uh so yeah i think uh, these would be i feel some of the major pain points for the advertisers marketers to probably look at uh, that from the app marketing lens yeah that's interesting and like understanding the most important pressure points would kind of like uh, allow digital marketers to probably focus on the right areas at the early stages of their campaign launches itself you know absolutely so with with that i would actually like to ask the similar question to you that uh, you know since i also talked about uh, ad fraud so what advice would you give to app marketers on navigating mobile ad fraud <laughs> it's interesting like uh, i'm like you, you you already mentioned that like we have been industry has been talking about ad fraud for like uh, last few years which is uh, which is which is a lot of content that went into that uh but then again uh i feel that uh investing in an attribution platform probably with a very strong fraud prevention suite is the very first resort against the fraud uh, aspect uh in a whole uh because uh, i think uh, attribution platforms uh being the gatekeepers of the traffic that comes in uh it's it, it they they kind of like are at a position where they can kind of like filter as much fraud as possible at the initial stages uh i think like uh, even attribution platforms fraud prevention suites have evolved a lot uh now kind of like people are getting used to these uh, uh features and then uh, more and more advertisers are adopting uh those uh, uh fraud uh, fraud mm -hmm. detection mechanism rather i would say uh, but also uh, one important thing that i would also uh, i would want to kind of like highlight here nishant is uh, it's, i i feel that like the brands also should kind of like be open in adopting some sort of fraud detection which can be built in house because uh, technically speaking not all sort of fraud can be kind of like uh, uh, identified and rejected at the source itself probably uh, there is a, a, a there is a, a, not probably but i certainly think that there is a lot of control uh, that uh, advertisers can have on what sort of uh, uh, data that they can authenticate and not authenticate like especially the revenue data uh, this can be validated by the uh, advertisers themselves and then probably uh, pass on that data to their mnps uh, which is uh, post validated data right so that is first party validated data so those exactly. are the uh, those are the things that i would say like finally the post install fraud detection is a segment that uh, advertisers should also be open to kind of like contribute in that but uh, all in all i would say uh, uh, my advice would be to actually pick a, a platform which has a very strong fraud prevention suite to start with that is going to save a lot of your time you don't have to worry about uh, spending several weeks on understanding and uh, trying to uh, evaluate a dedicated fraud prevention suite i would say until unless you reach a certain kind of like uh, uh, level of having to do that absolutely absolutely so i i think you rightly mentioned like, especially about uh, the internal data or the crm bi tools if you have to look at from the advertiser lens so i think the mmps and the uh, crm data should probably be talking to each other and that will i think actually make life easy for a lot of uh, uh, advertisers and and all the parties basically involved in the app marketing ecosystem yeah precisely uh, again like that's where that uh, like just we were talking in one of our earlier question like how different departments with the organization have to come together to achieve a common goal i think here different uh, uh, kind of like platforms have to come together 
uh, uh, in achieving a common goal. And then, like, I also probably, uh, I would also probably want to want to add on to another point in terms of making sure that the uh, brands actually choose uh, to work with those networks or the partners who who are kind of like guaranteeing that uh, clean traffic. Uh, so that Absolutely. is that is of utmost importance, I would say. That is the best way to actually combat fraud. <laughs> no, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Great. Now, I have one very interesting question. This is, Nishant, uh, what are the most uh, uh, common mistakes that app marketers make? And mm-hmm. how do you resolve them? And I, I don't know if I'm uh, putting you at a spot, but I want to listen to the most common mistakes that marketers do? No, I think definitely an interesting question. I think one of the most common thing that we also hear a lot of times and the expectations, you know, from the advertisers that, okay, we want to scale from day one, which <laughs> I feel is understandable because, you know, obviously... Does it even happen, by the way? Like, like, everybody wants to do that. Like, we want to scale from day one, but like, is it even practical? <laughs> exactly, that's what. So, you know, we, we need to understand that, okay, uh, you know, there are certain, like we were also talking about what stage of business uh, you're, you're in, right? And, uh, you know, that, that pressure, one needs to understand that, okay, I need to get scale from day one and that too with efficiency, with incrementality or all those points that we were talking about. But I feel it is very important for any platform, any, any channel, any network to understand and learn, uh, you know, the platform will optimize. There are different algorithms which will kick in. So usually a 30, 45 days of learning period is extremely important. Uh, also, what we were talking about earlier, like you mentioned, uh, you know, there's data, how different uh, departments and different teams can come together to, uh, you know, so that we can analyze the data in much more efficient manner. I think having too much data also becomes a problem at times, you know, what to do with that data, how to slice and dice that data in much more efficient way to optimize the campaign. I think some of the platforms are there in the market, like of course attribution platform, which is sort of, uh, you know, doing that. Beyond that also, probably you can look at some of the campaign managers, like, uh, you know, within mass also, what we do is we give advertisers uh, an MSI dashboard, which actually lets you slice and dice data and, and get recommendations based upon what sort of creatives are performing or based upon what sort of channels are performing, what optimization measures you can take. So all of that, I think, is very important. And like you mentioned in the previous, uh, you know, when we we're discussing about uh, ad fraud, it is also important to also look at, uh, you know, some of the internal CRM practices and the BI tools that usually people ignore that, you know, the MMP and the attribution platforms along with that, uh, you know, the CRM tools, etc., should be talking to each other. So that is also uh, at times, you know, if it's not happening, so obviously that leads to the discrepancies and that leads to some of the fraudulent activities which can come into the picture. The other thing which I feel is uh, also not diversifying enough in terms of the channels of probably putting your eggs in one uh, in, in a single basket, right? So uh, it becomes also important to having, say, multiple channels, you know, getting each of the channel uh, to an efficiency level wherein you can actually then look at scaling up and having that right balance. So I think all of this combined, I feel, are some of the common mistakes that usually the advertisers would be doing. Oh, wow. That's interesting. Like you had like four points as in like giving time to scale. And then this is interesting. Like you mentioned like 30 to 45 days. Is this the time that you think that like uh, a channel would deserve to kind of like uh, have a proper outcome to be seen? Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh-huh. Because, you know, at times if you're looking at uh, the end objective of, say, a transactional app would be that, okay, I'm looking at a certain yeah. customer acquisition cost and getting that from day one, obviously, it is a challenge. So one needs to give time, one needs to have that sort of patience and obviously money is also to invest in a platform wherein you can actually uh, look at the learning curve and from there optimize further. Mm-hmm. Interesting because we we sitting on the other side, like as on the, as on the measurement side or the tracker side, uh, we we keep hearing to the marketers that they they just look at the install numbers and then they are running on uh, they are looking at the cohorts of like maybe one day, two day, three day for the transaction to happen or maybe maximum seven days, exactly. right? And then 
uh, yeah, yeah, it makes perfect sense. And then also, I really like the other point that you mentioned when digital marketers have too much data and not knowing what needs to be done with that data. That's that's we very strongly believe that uh, uh, digital marketers are going through that phase because they have access to so much data sets because they 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 have to pull data from multiple stakeholders, uh, ad channels, or the exactly. partners being them or some of them and then they get the tracker data from their attribution platform and then they really don't have time uh to kind of like slice and dice that data in a manner that would present them with the best of the recommendations but yeah i completely agree to those points i, I think like these two are my favorite personally and i can very well relate to uh to the conversations right. that we have uh, with our advertisers Exactly. Exactly. Now, now from, uh, you know, I have another interesting question for you. Like, uh, you know, we talked about some of the mistakes that usually some someone can make uh, as an app, app marketer. Uh, mm -hmm. What do you think will be the key challenges for app marketers if you have to actually look at from this year's lens and, you know, how to make sure that they get the best results, uh, you know, while facing these challenges? Yeah, again, uh, see, there has been a lot of technological advancement over the recent past. Uh, I, I would say uh, the biggest challenges that digital marketers would be facing is one, adapting themselves to the changing privacy policies. <laughs> um, and you know, Nishant, like the whole industry uh, got mm -hmm. shocked by the introduction of SKAD network, right? <laughs> and then people were not prepared to, for it. And then people have kind of like reduced mm -hmm. their spends on iOS drastically. And then uh, though we have kind of like slightly stabilized uh, now, but uh, Android is going to come up with its own uh, Android privacy sandbox, which is right around the corner, which, uh, which, which kind of like can impact about 95 percentage of the uh, uh, marketing ecosystem in India. So uh, I would say uh, uh, privacy policies driven uh, marketing is going to be uh, a big challenge. Uh, I mean, like I would say that privacy policies are good to kind of like honor the uh, privacy of the individual users, but adapting digital marketers adapting to those policies and then fine tune their day-to-day -day process would be a certain challenge according to me and uh and then also on the budgets itself given the uh, uh current economic scenarios i think like uh, marketers have to be prepared to kind of like operate with a, a, a lean marketing budgets uh that means that the pressure is going to be on uh the uh the uh partners as well to kind of like operate among those budgets so those are the two uh, key challenges that I would see, at least given the current scenario, there are many other, but I would say that like this is, these are the primary ones, according to me. No, absolutely. I think from the media partner perspective, I, I, I would completely agree to that. Like uh, budgets as a challenge uh, for market air. So, so yeah, pretty much <laughs> in, in sync to what you said. <laughs> yeah, yeah, nice. Again, I think like uh, I have this uh, final question, uh, Nishant. What are your uh, what are some of the insights that needs to be focused upon and analyzed and analyzed by the app marketer once the campaign ends? We mm -hmm. spoke about uh, what are the key mistakes or the common mistakes that the app right. marketers would put themselves into usually. But this is what are the insights uh, that uh, marketers have to gather once the campaign ends Correct. what are your thoughts on it right so uh i think we talked about uh having too much data but now how to use our data in an efficient way is important is is what we were talking about so what we actually have to look at you know after the campaign ends is probably how you have been able to cater to different audiences at multiple touch points i think that is extremely important uh probably you know that can be done through a b testing that okay you were running the campaign on multiple audiences what sort of results you've been able to derive out of different audience sets what sort of creatives perform the best 
uh, you know, optimizing the creatives in terms of the banner sizes or the right uh, messaging, you know, which would be working for your brand is extremely important. So getting some understanding around that, probably building out a model which would help you also, you know, look at uh, some of the down the funnel KPIs. Uh, we were talking about uh, some of the metrics, uh, metrics like uh, Ravi mentioned about uh, ROAS. I think ROAS definitely, I feel in the long, long run, is the most important uh, insight that uh, you know can actually let you know that okay, what was the overall campaign health? You know whether the spends that you made at a you know on a certain channel made sense or not. Uh, similarly, looking at uh, the LTVs of the user, whether the user is coming back or not, right? Along with that. Um, also, you know, looking at a full funnel sort sort of an approach that okay, uh, these were my top top funnel results, and from there, how uh, you know one can look at uh, optimizing towards uh, say down the funnel metrics. So all of this combined, I think, will be the right uh, sweet spot for the advertiser to to you know have that efficient uh, model and the right sort of uh, metrics uh, to look at. Okay. Now, uh, I have a follow-up question to that, Nishant. Uh, you mentioned about creatives a lot, right? Uh, how important it is uh, for the digital marketers to kind of like uh, onboard it tools which would allow them to easily analyze the creative performances? Usually, uh, I mean, like, I have not heard, I mean, like, again, like in Singular, we do mm -hmm. have this amazing feature called as creative reporting. What we do is we actually pull the creative assets themselves and then we mm -hmm. attach an ROI to it. Now, do you think that like ability to kind of like connect the uh, most important metrics at the creative asset themselves, not mm -hmm. the creative names perhaps, but the creative assets themselves would benefit digital marketers to kind of like uh, 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 in the in the long run, exactly. I think uh, we shouldn't be looking at obviously creative names or maybe you know even the banner sizes etc. That okay, you understand that probably this banner size would perform the best, and mm -hmm. and uh, you know like you rightly mentioned that there are multiple tools which are available. Uh, you know, singular has it, and similarly, you know, we at Mass also are doing something on these lines. Like I talked about M inside dashboard, which we give to our advertisers. Mm -hmm. Right, so we can also give uh, creative level analysis uh, at a you know from the incrementality lens also that okay this particular creative would probably give a better ROI or probably this uh, mm -hmm. you know wherein we can actually look at incrementality also that okay the, these sort of banners will probably bring in more incrementality. Uh, I think the messaging of uh, that particular uh, you know for the right persona of the audience is also important that okay if you're choosing the audience. You know what will be the right uh, set of creatives which will actually be uh, you know relevant to that sort of uh, uh, an audience. So probably a deal hunter would not really want to see uh, you know an an ad which will show a premium product. Similarly, you know someone you know if you're trying to promote uh, uh, a brand uh, you know which is into a uh, you know maybe luxury segment. So obviously one cannot have say, uh, you know, something uh, to do around get 50% discount or 100% off or whatever, you know, these sort of uh, banners would not work. Yeah, that's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, I think, right. uh, yeah, uh, we kind of say like, concluded those questions maybe and then uh, should we set the pace for like the closing thoughts? Uh, like Absolutely. I think we can look at uh, probably summarizing our thoughts. So, Raghu, mm -hmm. would you want to uh do that yeah uh, uh my thoughts uh, are basically uh, two points uh, one is uh, choosing the right partner to invest in is very very important uh, we often see that a lot of people uh, uh undermine this uh, uh this this specific topic uh we still uh, see that like uh, marketers or the brands uh, taking decisions based on the pricing rather than the quality or the value that the tool or a partner would add into their day-to-day -day lives. Uh, that's uh, that's one of the thoughts that I had. And uh, on the second one uh, is I feel that industry in general is going through a lot of transformation. Uh, primarily one is the 
privacy policies that are being uh, i wouldn't say enforced uh, that are rather i would say adopt being adopted uh, mm -hmm. which are in the best interest of the uh, consumers that is one uh, uh, we need to equip ourselves to kind of like stay ahead of the curve in terms of learning and adapt our uh, uh, functioning which are going to work in line with those policies and then also uh, i think like we are, we, we are at the time we are moving towards a different sort of measurement uh, i would say and uh, uh, we in singular we are uh, working a lot or innovating a lot around mixed media modeling that we, we believe that that would be a future uh, mm -hmm. yeah these are the two thoughts that uh, i have got it got it right so so just, just summarizing the, my uh, thoughts also so you know probably uh, i would also like to say that uh, you know what we are talking about in terms of uh, having the right sort of you know how we can leverage on the data i think segregating good data bad data also i feel is extremely important you know which can actually lead to taking the corrective uh, actions to optimize the campaign so that becomes extremely important uh, you know from the lens of looking at uh, you know from the full funnel optimization strategy so i think that is one thing which is extremely important and also you know looking at uh, the data led approach you know identifying the right audiences to target and then planning the right uh, media mix what we were talking about earlier you know in terms of the right uh, sort of diversification and having that balanced approach so i guess these these two things i would like to uh, just just summarize with wow that's amazing uh, conversation uh, nishan thank you so much uh, for uh, for sharing your thoughts thank you thank you so much Raghu. it was a pleasure interacting with you thank you same here thank you so much Uh, so hey everyone, please uh, start putting your uh, question in our Q and A box so that our panelists can answer that. Thank you. I think there is one question around. Uh... How do you think vernacular will play a major role in 2023? I think vernacular definitely, I feel, is going to be important, uh, especially you know when we are looking at uh, say expanding beyond the uh, you know the the typical use case which the advertisers have is uh, you know reaching out to the next hundred million shoppers. You know how to do that. So I think that is where it is going to be quite critical. Uh, the having a right vernacular strategy, uh, especially if you're targeting tier two, tier three audiences. So that's what I feel, uh, you know, it is definitely going to be uh, an important uh, part of uh, the campaigns and any any sort of uh, campaign strategy for the advertisers. Uh, Raghu, I think uh, you're, on, you're on mute. Thanks. That we try to not that talk in the view, but still that happens. Uh, uh, yeah, I was saying that like I'm quite surprised to see a very interesting question on SK Ad Network, SK Ad Network Four in specific. Uh, thanks for that question, first of all, and uh, uh, good evening, everyone, uh, or rather good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, the question is, uh, how do you think the industry is responding to scan four? Uh, can you throw us some throw some light on? Yes, uh, scan four is pretty new. I would say uh, we are still a lot of preparation that needs to be done. Uh, I would say that uh, time it's going to take a lot of time for us to kind of like adapt and support to the changes that are being incorporated by scan. Uh, Again, uh, that's one uh, thing. And then the other one is there's a lot of work that we need to put in, right? Like that means that technically requires all the partners to come together and then be prepared for the changes that are being introduced in the scan because a lot of those partners are not yet prepared for scan three, let alone scan four. Uh, those are some of the kind of like highlight points. But uh, on a positive note, I would say that uh, 
know, like we always had this restriction on the number of post packs that uh, we would receive for for scan because the way attribution works and scan is quite completely different as opposed to the traditional way of functioning. So uh, scan is allowing a lot more post packs on uh, specifically scan 4.0. Which is very very interesting. That would allow us to kind of like uh, uh, kind of like expand our our horizons. Uh, uh, that's one. And then also uh, we're gonna get uh, have uh, uh, an interesting insights on the source identifiers. Uh, another positive that I would see is uh, web app capabilities has been uh, improved upon on Scan Four, which was not something that was. Uh, very well defined in scan three, but again, it has its own challenges. Even there, we can only operate on a scan browsers. Uh, and uh, one very peculiar thing that everyone had a question on as a crowd anonymity. Uh, I think uh, we will have more clarity on the crowd anonymity in scan four and beyond. Uh, those are the few points I would say. Again, I'm not sure whether that would answer the question because uh, scan three itself was quite confusing, and the question was on scan four. Uh, but I uh, hope I answered that one. Yeah. Right. So we have another question, which is: Should we optimize our campaigns for deep funnel metrics and track the data, or we optimize for top mid funnel metrics? Um, interesting one. I think uh, you know it is again dependent upon what exactly the end objective is. So. For maybe uh, a transaction lab, I think it will make sense to look at uh, you know the bottom funnel metrics. I think that becomes quite important and tracking that uh, in sync with your internal uh, platforms and data uh, to avoid any sort of discrepancies or something and uh, that typically you know some someone usually faces. So that sort of challenge that we also see at times you know can can come across. Uh, that is uh, important and also um, you know maybe for some some of the other categories you know uh, maybe a top mid funnel sort of metrics would be important like say on the content side or ott's uh, that's that's my take on on this uh, question i hope uh, it answers so very uh, ragu anything if you would want to add on yeah. You had pretty much answered that question in a that uh, again, uh, it very much depends, as you rightly pointed out, Nishan, depending upon the uh, uh, the platform that you're currently operating in or the channel with whom you're trying to run campaigns or the vertical that you kind of like uh, are in. Uh, I would say, uh, again, probably from a tracking perspective, I, I think like in order for all of these things to happen, you need to have access to a tool which allows you. Uh, kind of like to analyze this metrics just in a comfortable and convenient manner, right? Onboarding the right set of tools to kind of like have access to that metrics. Uh, metrics keep changing all the time. So uh, uh, depending upon the season, depending upon the category, depending upon the types of the campaigns that you're running, but what remains is basically the infrastructure that is there to kind of like understand or complement you with information. Uh, yeah. Uh, I would say um, that onboarding a very strong tool to back those metrics or the funnel analysis is equally uh, very important. Rightly mentioned. Rightly mentioned. Uh, another question is around uh, Apple search ads. So I think uh, definitely this is also quite critical, especially with the changes that we've already seen, which has happened uh, you know, within the Apple ecosystem. So having the right iOS strategy, but obviously, uh, you know, with search ads, especially, you know, if we have to look at, uh, you know, from the mass lens also, I think this is something which we also suggest to our advertisers. And uh, today, I think we would be working with multiple advertisers for, for this uh, as well. So I think uh, Apple search ad, uh, you know, having the right strategy, having the right sort of identifying uh, the right sort of keywords, having the right brand strategy, you know, giving, uh, getting uh, the visibility on uh, the iOS, uh, you know, Apple Store also is is quite important. Similar to you know uh, some of the other Play Stores, Google Play Store, etc. So uh, I think this definitely should go in sync with uh, the the Android uh, strategy for any uh, app marketer. Uh, 
Right, and uh, and interestingly, since it's about Apple search ads, I would probably add a sentence or two. Uh, uh, I have met many marketers who claim to say that, like, I'm going to stop all sort of marketings on iOS and only stick to uh, Apple search ads. Right. Uh, that is that is predominantly uh, because their uh, uh, fear of uh, on the point that they might not be able to track the other channel partners campaign on scan. No, that's not the fact. You don't have to limit yourself to uh, uh, Apple search ads, not at all. Uh, scan has evolved a lot, which means that even if you are running campaigns with uh, affiliate marketing ad networks, other channels, you are equally kind of like you can be assured that there is a very strong accurate tracking that is happening on a scan network so search ads of course you can continue to kind of like invest on apple search ads but not at a compromise of uh, on a fear that you wouldn't be able to track if you were to run on other campaigns right? no rightly mentioned absolutely so there's another question for both of us that uh, what are the key categories which have grown since 2020 and is there any insight or maybe categories that you've seen beyond these uh, traditional categories? Raghu, you want to take that? Uh, so I'm not sure by the category, maybe are you talking about uh, the verticals or the, the gaming and things like that or uh, <laughs> uh, 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 probably if I have to read that, that question in that manner, uh, I would say uh, I'm mean, like this. I'm mean, like fintech has something that has really picked up since 2020 because it has really changed the way that people have been transacting. Uh, 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 that's the biggest change I've seen on the fintech side. A lot of innovation that is happening, uh, but. Uh, but this new category that has been created, if you look at it, uh, it is on the, the shift in the categories. There were categories, the similar categories in the past, like the gaming. Uh, we, we we never used to talk too much about gaming in the past, but uh, since pandemic, we have seen a very tremendous growth on the gaming sector, especially in India, uh, as we had also discussed in the uh, earlier segment. Uh, though, I would say that uh, these are the categories. I think like these categories will rise, uh, kind of like create opportunities for innovation. So it's not actually change in category, but it's an innovation within that category, which is going to probably create a new segment altogether. Uh, but uh, but uh, yeah, that that's purely uh, like uh, my point of view. Probably Nishant, you can add. More to that. Right. So I think another viewpoint also here is like uh, comparing it with 2020. So versus now, I think with markets completely opened, and uh, I think some of the verticals at that moment of time, which were probably getting uh, the sort of uplift. So interestingly, like what we saw within some of the uh, you know fintech spaces that uh, you know people were taking a lot of insurances, and and uh, you know there was such a huge amount of organic push which was happening, which I think now things are sort of normalizing, uh, you know, getting back to normal. Uh, the categories like travel, et cetera, have pretty much opened up. Um, that is where I, I feel, uh, you know, the change is, uh, is uh, probably coming in from these uh, sort of uh, categories. And uh, like just to add on top of that, like while I was thinking, uh, I I saw one interesting category. There are, there are a couple of advertisers whom I have seen, which I could have never thought. Like they they can actually test the products. I don't know which category should I be putting them into. Uh, they are a mix of on demand and uh, and e commerce and sort of things. Uh, there there are these apps where you can simply test the products. All right. Uh, without you having to buy anything and then only commit yourself to kind of like uh, have a long-term association with that product. Not to primarily seen it on the cosmetic side, that's on the e uh, And the other one is the learning app. Like there's a lot of fun gaming angle to it. Like I'm not sure, I'm sure Nishant, you would have encountered 
encountered that a lot experiencing the campaigns, uh, driving campaigns for a lot of these verticals. They're just segment of category where you can't call them like the gaming, but they are game within each of the different categories. Uh, they, there are a lot of games which allow you to uh, bet and play, but they are talking about stock market while they are not actually trading anything there. And then there is a category that port, uh, you are kind of learning uh, fun sort of a category. I don't know where to put that. I think you have more, uh, more around category, uh, but know. that's something that Education, education with gamification is something uh, you know what what you're sort of uh, trying to say exactly. I think that is what we've been seeing, and and uh, you know some of the advertisers around that we we have also seen uh, you know growing uh, in in the past uh, few years. So probably uh, and and also you know along with that uh, bringing in some of the technology play or the innovation play around uh, you know AI ML etc. So that is where also I I feel uh, you know the industry or probably the categories etc are going to evolve interesting right <laughs> right so uh, the other question uh, i think like we have the question to you i think this is probably uh, uh okay there is this question uh, from uh, priya where can we see m filter fraud tool in coming years and how this is very accurate in digital uh, uh priya uh, frankly speaking uh, fraud is a very uh, an important uh, topic and uh, and we have also seen this 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 topic evolving a lot right earlier we were talking about performance fraud detection uh, now we are even talking about uh, brand fraud detection right like because you don't want your ads to be placed in a place where you don't want them to be placed like what what purpose does uh, uh, kind of like and uh, kind of like an education based uh, ads being shown in a pornographic site or uh, uh, on such publishing website. So uh, it's also evolved, and uh, I myself have been uh, uh, interacting with uh, and filter team for a while, and then we have seen that there is a lot of innovation that is happening, and I can certainly see that for anyone uh, to that matter to kind of like come and innovate and identify ways to kind of like add value to the entire digital marketing system uh, so uh, and and on the accuracy that's a very tough uh, thing to answer because uh, we can we cannot uh, uh, say how accurate the platform is again what is important is making sure that you pick the right tool uh, given the circumstances and then the given the persona that they bring on how aspiration in do for the problems that they claim to solve right uh, on that uh, aspect, uh, I would say uh, nothing can be 100% accurate, but working together and then ensuring that we are contributing to the ultimate uh, uh, success is what is very important. And just to add on another point uh, is, is also uh, segregating good data, bad data, and having the right set of people uh, within the team, you know, who can probably play that sort of role for you, you know, while you're dependent upon the tools, uh, you know, external tools which are available. But still, I, I feel, uh, you know, technically one should understand in depth because this is like a vast topic. You know, one should have that sort of understanding around, uh, you know, what sort of uh, fraud categories are there and, you know, how people can be taken for a ride. So I think that is important to understand this and that can happen, you know, once some someone has that sort of training and, and probably understands uh, th this uh, particular uh, topic. Yeah, I think like we have another question. Uh, 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 Nishant, uh, uh, the question is, what would be a good split between organic and inorganic installs in the gaming industry. That's interesting. Yeah, maybe uh, right. you can so take I that think, up. Uh, within, within, again, so within gaming industry, I feel, you know, depends upon, uh, again, uh, you know, sort of 
can be related to seasonality also like you know typically what we would see is maybe um, you know once covid happened so we, we saw what sort of uptick happened in some of the uh, apps within the gaming segment also like ludo of uh, ludo kings of the world and all those apps you know which became trending and you know became hugely popular during that time so which was majorly the play of organic so you know i think that also depends upon the time of the week maybe weekends we would typically see uh, the organic boost or or probably you know people glued on to their devices uh, and and playing those games uh, i think also important is uh, uh, again uh, you know can happen say during say diwali season when we typically see the rmg uh, sort of uh, apps real money gaming apps to be uh, you know more popular during that one of time so the right sort of split i think is not really one can actually comment upon it totally depends upon the uh, the app the brand uh, probably you know someone already doing some sort of brand activity which uh, you know is is there probably on tv would see a huge uh, organic jump uh versus uh, a new brand which is not really spending on any sort of branding activity so it's slightly subjective sort of a question yeah i completely agree to your answer in the sense like there's no one number that you can say that this is a split in fact i would encourage uh people to kind of like work towards attaining maximum organic uh conversions that is going to help you uh, from a monetary standpoint of view and a personal growth standpoint of view you should hit for maximum organic uh, conversions uh, and choose wisely whom to work with on the non organic segment and then ensure that you getting the best out of it that is should be the mantra there is no one number that would say that this is best or that is best okay. uh Thank you everyone for joining this session. Uh, I hope it was useful to you. Uh, in case if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to us over our website singular.net or you can use any of our LinkedIn profiles and reach out to us. Uh, once again, uh, have a good rest of the day. Bye bye. Yeah. Thank you so much guys. Thanks for joining the session today. It was uh, really nice uh, you know attending the session. Uh, you know thanks Raghu. you know you can anyone can reach out to us just feel free to reach out to us over linkedin uh, thanks again hey everyone thank you so much for the, joining this session a big thanks to our panelists for sharing such good examples and the statistics we have definitely learned a lot for, from this session uh, thanks again have a good day